Good morning, everyone. Oh, that was, that was okay, but we've got a few more people in here. Good morning, everyone. Oh, that's, oh, wow, even from behind, it's like surround sound up here. I love it. Uh, well, good morning. My name is Dave Ulmer, and it's a pleasure for me to be your host this morning. Welcome to State College Alliance Church. We're so glad that you could be with us this morning. Uh, I have a few announcements that I'd like to make. The first, just as a reminder, we'd love to know who's here with us this morning, whether you're here in person or, or visiting with us online. There are several ways that you can tell us you're here. First, you can use the QR code on the back of your bulletin or scan the screen, or if you're online, you can even scan it there as well. Uh, you can use one of the check-in cards that's in the seat pocket in front of you. Or you can also, if you're online, just simply say who you are in the chat and tell us where you're worshiping from. Uh, as someone who also is the online host sometimes, it's really amazing to hear people uh, participating from all over, sometimes all over the world, but often across the United States and, and even catch up with those who are traveling. So please check in with us today. We'd love to know uh, if you're, you're visiting with us. I have a, a few announcements that I'd like to go over uh, today. They're all found uh, in the bulletin, both the print and the online version. If you're not getting the online version, please contact the church office so we can make sure that you're getting that as well. The first is the program called Out of the Cold. We've talked about it before, and it starts tomorrow. Out of the Cold is a program where we can help the local homeless population by giving them a place to stay for a week. They're going to be in the lobby starting tomorrow night for the week, uh, and then during the day, they're in different activities and in other places. Um, thank you to all of you who have already signed up to help and are looking to serve. We do have a few more spots available for volunteers. So if you're interested in helping to serve meals or interacting with the guests, or if you have the ability to drive vans either in the morning or in the evening, we'd love to have you participate. There are instructions for volunteering in the bulletin. Um, you're not going to bother me if you pull out your phone and you do that right now. That's probably more important than listening to me. So if you're able to, to volunteer, feel free to open up your phone, sign up for Out of the Cold. If you have any other questions about the program, please contact Pastor Aiden. Next Sunday, we're going to be having our next Living Water service. How many of you participated in a Living Water service before? Yeah, that's a great opportunity to get together, to commune with others, and to just sit in the presence of God and worship him and pray together. So it's a one hour service that we hold once a month. It starts at 6.15 next Sunday evening, open to everyone, you don't need to sign up. Uh, just a time of worship and prayer and we'd love to have you here. Um, so that's next Sunday, Living Water Service at 6.15 p.m. And the final announcement today is starting in just under two weeks, we're gonna be starting our Missions Emphasis Week. So you may have, if you've been in this church for a while, you know we've had lots of different ways that we've celebrated missionaries, and I remember many flag ceremonies, all kinds of things. This is a great opportunity for you to hear about what God is doing around the world. So we are going to have an international missions worker who's here for the week. Now, we can't publicize who it is because of where they serve in the world, and we want to be very conscious of their safety, but we're going to have an international missions worker who's here for a week. We're going to kick things off with a church potluck on Friday, April 1st. We're going to have an afternoon uh, lunch on April 2nd, which is more of a Q&A opportunity to, uh, to talk with this missions worker who's here. And then we're also going to be having activities during the service on Sunday, April 3rd, among other things. So additional details are online. If you would like to participate in any of the meal events, we'd ask you to please RSVP. You can RSVP online. Instructions are in the bulletin, or you can contact the church office. Again, that kicks off on Friday, April 1st, and will be a week of missions emphasis. Again, so glad that you're here with us this morning. We're going to transition into a time of worship. Would you stand with us this morning? Good morning, church. It is good to gather in the name of Jesus together today. I don't know what you're carrying into this room today, what's heavy on your heart or what thoughts are swirling around in your mind, but I encourage you to open yourself up to these words from Psalm 90. They're words of a desperate plea for the Lord to capture our attention and align us to him today. The psalmist says to the Lord, satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. So today we're going to claim that satisfaction and push forward in praise. Join us as we sing hymn number 215, When Morning Gilds the Skies. Mm -hmm. 
When morning kills the skies, my heart awaking cries, may Jesus Christ be praised, alike at work and prayer, to Jesus I repair, may Jesus Christ of darkness fear when this sweet song they hear may Jesus Christ be praised ye nations of mankind in this your concord find may Jesus Christ be praised let all the Jesus Christ be praised. That is our sacred song today. May Jesus Christ be praised. It's a song we can sing for our entire lives. May Jesus Christ be praised. Our God is worthy of all of our glory. He loved us so much that he sent us his son to save us, to pardon us, to raise us up and to cause us to rejoice. So would you do that with us right now? Lift your voice with us in hymn number 54, my tribute. To God be the glory, to God be the glory, to God.
Would you pray with me this morning? Father, great things you have done. May we come before you today just praising and worshiping your name for your goodness, for your greatness, God, for your power. God, as we open the scriptures today, would you speak to our hearts? Spirit, we invite you into this place. Even before the service, we were praying, and just that, that idea that, that apart from you, we can do nothing. But God, that we would be connected to you, to the vine, and God, that your goodness, that your mercy, that your grace would flow to us and then through us to your world. So, Father, we thank you for this opportunity to, to worship your name and to come before you and to, that you would speak to us through your spirit. And so, we invite you here to work and to move in this time and place. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning. My name is Aiden. I am uh, the associate pastor of Outreach, and uh, Pastor Aaron wanted me to pass on his greetings to you today. He is on campus. So last week, Pastor Dan Min was up here preaching, uh, so they did a bit of a pulpit exchange. So they were on spring, uh, Penn State was on spring break, so we had Dan Min with us. Now that they're back on campus, Aaron uh, is there, kind of back in his old stomping grounds, uh, preaching with ACF this morning. So um, we have you lift him up in prayer and pray for him as he's there. Uh, but he does send his greetings and will be back with us again uh, this coming Sunday. Uh, so today I'm uh, continuing the series that, we've, series that we've been going through for a while called uh, Seven Critical Questions. And today the question is, what are the greatest obstacles before us, right? What are the greatest obstacles before us? Because anything worth doing, anything that, that requires some effort, you're going to run into an obstacle at some point or another, right? I, I uh, was watching the news this past week, and amidst all of the other stories about conflict in Ukraine and all of that, there was, there was this uh, a little short about uh, trucks, self-driving trucks, that they're testing, uh, and uh, in a, I, I saw that, you know, they had these radar systems, like, that they could see all around them, and they could literally see what was in front of them, and to navigate through the streets, and of course, they had a driver there with his hands not on the wheels, and it was just baffling to me, and I started thinking, like, I heard about these self-driving cars a while ago, and I was like, I thought Google was doing that, like, what's, what's taking so long? Well, I just heard they, they kept running into obstacles. Yeah, that was a joke, so... <laughs> Uh, yeah. 
Yeah, so <laughs> uh, I'm a dad. You can use dad jokes, right? Um, but, 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 but in all seriousness, seriousness it, was, it was amazing that this, that, that this truck could almost like see humans and see other cars and navigate through obstacles. And, uh, you know, as we look through even the very first series of questions that Pastor Aaron talked in the series, like looking at what is our current reality and what is our desired future? Well, that gap between where we are and, and where we want to be, well, if there weren't obstacles in front of us, we'd already be there. So it's really tied intricately into that, into that first question, those first questions. What are our greatest obstacles? Right? And, I, and I think about... Um, for me, you know, back before I, well, actually, as I met my wife, I think in the context of relationship, what were the greatest obstacles to me when I was, my wife Emily, uh, when I first met her, um, we were both teaching in uh, high school, high school teachers, high school music teachers, and uh, we both took students to the same uh, music festival. It was actually hosted here at State High School, um, so uh, our romance began here in State College. Um, but, but while we were there, uh, we were just, we were hanging around with another group of young teachers at the, at the conference, at the state, it was a district choir festival, and uh, at the, on the Saturday night, uh, or maybe it was Friday night, they had a dance, a swing dance for the students. And State High had a jazz band, and so they had a live band and playing swing music. And uh, I had taken swing dancing uh, le lessons in college and had danced in here. So I meet this girl, and I was like, hey, do you know how to swing dance? And she says, yeah, I do. I was like, me too. Uh, do you want to dance? And uh, so I was just friendly, but the, the kids had a, had a, a riot with it when we got back. They're like, oh, Mr. Wirtz, you were dancing with the teacher. Um, so when I, when I got back home, I realized that in the information they gave us that they had a list of all of the high school directors, like a directory, and I'm going down through it, and, and her name is Miss Homan, and it's like, ah, oh, I've got her number. <laughs> so it's like, oh, there we go, the door's open, right? And then until I, until I sit there and I punch it in my phone, and then suddenly, what, what starts happening in my chest? Like, my heart starts, like, beating a little bit faster. I get this weird feeling in my stomach, and I'm about to hit, and this is, like, the days of, like, early cell phones. This is my flip phone, right? I probably punched it in there and then flipped the, the phone shut. And then go back and open up and punch it again. And there's something that happens, like this obstacle within me before I hit send to make that phone call. And so finally, I get the, the courage to, to, to get over that. And I, and I hit send, and I, and I call, and, and she answers. And I say, oh, hi, uh, is this Emily? And she says, yeah. And I said, and she says, who is this? And I said, this is Aiden. And she says, and this is where our stories divide. See, <laughs> she says, I didn't say it this way. And I'm like, oh. This is how I heard you. <laughs> but I say, this is Aiden. And she says, where'd you get this number? <laughs> and I was like, oh, obstacle. <laughs> okay, uh-oh. <laughs> um, and so, so then I start backpedaling. It's like, well, you know, they gave us all the numbers of the teachers, and I just wanted to say I had a good time. And then I I'm, I'm lose all confidence at that point. And, and I say, well, if ever you want to go swing dancing again, just give me a call and let me know. <laughs> and... She later tells me, she's thinking on the other end of the line, she's like, yeah, if you ever want to go swing dancing, you can give me a call. <laughs> so, um, yeah, eventually we did, you know, uh, end of story, we're married now. But <laughs> there, there's a lot more parts in there, but uh, yeah, we'll wrap that one up. But as I was reflecting on this, you know, thinking about what are our greatest obstacles, how many of them, much like when I was trying to make that phone call, you know, it was an obstacle that was here in my heart that was inhibiting me from taking a step forward. And so today, as we look at this scripture, I'm just really looking at what are, you know, there are going to be obstacles and threats, and there are things that are in the world that, that come against us, or that we run up against. But really, what I see in this scripture for today is what are our hearts, and what's our posture towards that, and do we have the courage to step forward through those obstacles. So, my greatest obstacles are within my own heart. Um, so today, we're going to be looking in uh, Second Chronicles, chapter 20. So if you have your Bible, you can, can flip there. Uh, we're about a third of the way through here in the Bible. If you're looking for, where's Second Chronicles? First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles. 
and all those things. There was, there was a rap back in like the 90s uh, that, that taught me some of the books of the Bible in the Old Testament. So that's where we're going to be. Um, so in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, some cultural context. Where are we in the history of Israel in this? Because Chronicles starts at Adam and, the, and, and genealogy, and it really, First Chronicles focuses on David and, and the joint kingdom of Israel underneath David, uh, how, how, how uh, he established, really established the throne. And then his, his son Solomon takes over after him. And, uh, you know, Solomon, of course, who, who asked for wisdom and God gave it to him. And Solomon, who many of the Proverbs are attributed to. Um, uh, scholars think that maybe even Ecclesiastes and that wisdom literature is attributed to Solomon. But then after Solomon, in, in Israel, things fall apart. And um, it splits into two kingdoms, what they call the divided kingdoms. And so this takes place, uh, the fourth king in the lower kingdom, which is now called Judah. It gets very confusing because, like, wasn't it Israel under David? Yes, it was. But now we've suddenly got two. We've got Israel in the north and then the southern kingdom of Judah that, that used to be all one but now is split. So, so this is King Jehoshaphat. And, um, boy, I'm like, I'm, there are certain names in the Bible that I'm glad that I am not named and, and this is probably one of them. It's just, I don't know, but I, I don't even know what it means, but it probably means great things. But, but King Jehoshaphat, um, so this is where we pick up the story. Uh, he actually just kind of, he, he was one of the better kings that he would go throughout, went out throughout the land, tearing down the idols, tearing down um, the, the, the uh, idol worship, the high places that they had established. So he was someone that found favor in God's sight, but he certainly wasn't perfect, the account right before this in chapter 19, we see him actually, the king from the north invites him up to fight a battle with him, and he doesn't consult the Lord. It says like, because of like, he, he throws a big party and he, he sacrifices sheep and he gives, gives King Jehoshaphat all these things of like cattle and sheep that, and, and, and he's like, oh, this is nice. And so he joins with the king in Israel, doesn't consult the Lord, goes out in battle, and, and they're just... I mean, the king, the other king in the north, he dies. He gets an arrow in him, and he ends up dying. The Lord protects Jehoshaphat, but he has to retreat. So, so he's kind of licking his wounds from, from this battle that he just went out and fought. And, and so this is the state of mind that he's in as we see him here in chapter 20, because it says, after this, after what? All of this that's happened in his life, trying to do good things for God, kind of forgetting his way, getting defeated, coming back. And then after this, what happens? Well, it says the Moabites and the Ammonites, and with them some of the Meunites came against Jehoshaphat for battle. So this southern kingdom, as he comes back and defeats, now suddenly not just one army, but these three armies are gathering together. So if you imagine, like, here's Israel, and here's the Jordan River on the eastern side. These are the tribes that lived, on, like the Transjordanian, on the other side of the Jordan. They're saying, hey, we're going to come and we're going to attack. So here comes this external threat Right? And, and this is where we see him, that, that what does he do, right? In the very next line, as, as, uh, or actually we'll read the next uh, verse in verse 2. It says, Some men came and told Jehoshaphat, A great multitude is coming against you from Edom, from beyond the sea, and behold, they are in Hazazon Tamar, that is in Gedi. So like right outside, like a couple days journey away. And what happens with Joseph, Jehoshaphat? It says, Then Jehoshaphat was afraid. I'm just gonna, I know the sentence goes on, but we're going to pause right there. Because I think this responds, this like reflects my heart, that when we are in conflict, right, when wh whatever it might be, when we are in conflict, like he was experiencing, a conflict is coming towards him, an external threat, what happens in my heart? Well, I don't know about you, but my heart tends to respond in fear and anxiety, Right? fear and anxiety. So, uh, and I don't know if this just comes from my, my family of origin, right, where I, where I grew up. We were a non-confrontational family, right? We were just like, if ever someone like raised their voice a little bit, it was like, oh, I'm in trouble, you know? I didn't, I never, I, I don't know what was wrong with me. Like, I, I, I did not want, I had such a sense of shame. I didn't want to disappoint my parents. And so I would try and do all the good things and all the right things because, like, if they even, like, gave me this, the, the look, I was like, oh, 
I don't want this confrontation, right? Uh, a story about this, like even, so Emily, she comes from the opposite, right? So they were a loud family. If they had something they wanted to say, they would like, they would say it. And she's like, what's wrong with you guys? You don't say how you're really feeling. So we were visiting with my sister over the holidays, and uh, we had some like differences of opinion on the rest of our travel plans. And so Emily starts to, you know, she's like, well, I think that this is what we should do. Starts raising her voice. And my sister, she's just like, <gasps> and she just like walks out of the room. And, and, and later she came back and she said to both Emily and I, she's like, oh, that was just getting way too tense for me. I just, I couldn't handle it. I had to walk out of the room. And like Emily, and later on, Emily's like, that was nothing. Like, we were just, was I loud? Was I, I wasn't even yelling. I'm like, well, that's yelling in my family, <laughs> right? So yeah, I, it's just this stress response, right? And I remember as, when I was a child, the very first time that I, that I had like this confrontation with a threat against me, um, I, I was a, moved to a new school when I was in fifth grade, and it was a K through six school, and so there were the sixth graders that were above us, and there was a boy uh, in sixth grade whose name was Russell, right? Russell. And Russell, like literally, like he was he was bigger than most of the other kids. Of course, I was I was a little little guy, and he the sixth grader, like he seemed like the giant, right? And he had like this long kind of tossed brown hair. He lived in like the rough part of town. And then I swear, I don't know if this is just a memory I made up, but but he had this scar <laughs> that went down his face, right? And so you just try to avoid him. Right? And then one day, when I'm leaving the school, got my backpack on, I don't see him there, and I accidentally like I'm maybe walking backwards and I bump into him. And he looks at me, and he's like, what do you got a problem with me? I mean, that's probably not really what he said, but this is the memory, right? And I'm like, no, uh, sorry. And I start walking, walking away, and, and I, I go, there's two ways you could go that kind of led to a single point, like where the crossing guard was across the street, right? And so I go one way, he goes another way, and then, and then we both hit this point at the same time. I'm like, here, I think I'm done. I'm like, oh. I already, my heart's kind of bumping. I'm like, I'm, I'm talking to another kid. I'm like, oh my gosh, I think Russell's mad at me. And then of course, like I'm saying this and he's like right there and he's like, what, you think I'm mad at you? <laughs> and then that's when that fear responds, right? My heart starts pounding, you know, and my, my stomach feels all like in knots. I'm like, uh, no. And then, <laughs> and then for whatever reason, I remember like I, I clench my fist down at my sides and he looks down and, and he sees my fist and he's like, oh, what, you want to fight? <laughs> at that point, I'm like, no. <laughs> and then luckily, like, I think the, car, the, tri the, the crossing guard, who had no idea what was going on, walks out, puts up the stop sign. I, like, run across the street. He goes the other way. And, like, but this is my response to, to stress, right, or to, to a threat. What do I do? I am, I, am, I am not naturally a fighter, right? It's either fight or flight, right? I am one that just would, like, run away from it. And uh, uh, th that is not what we see here in Jehoshaphat, all right? And so we're going to look at, at his response, because I think there are those two responses, right? That there's this, this fear response that we might be like, okay, I, if I'm going to fight it, I am going to kind of size up my opponent, and I'm going to take control of the situation, and I'm going to get the result that I want. Or there's my response to this flight of, size up the situation, and I always size myself down small, and I'm going to get out of here and rescue myself, all right? And, and I feel like, and I've, I've seen this in, in um, you know, even, it was even before the pandemic, if you look at, at the rise of fear, and the rise of anxiety across all sorts of different populations, particularly I hear about college students and students of just the rising anxiety, and then the pandemic hit, and now there's all sorts of other things that are layered on top of it that we just live in an anxious time. And how do we respond to all that anxiety? And, and I feel like the news doesn't help. You know, they put in front of us all these bad things that could be happening. I feel like politicians often don't help because they'll say like, oh, you know, we need to be afraid of these people because they're going to come and they're going to attack us. And so therefore, get on my side and do this thing with me because we should be afraid. But I don't feel like this is, this is not what God's calling us to be or who he's calling to be. He doesn't call us to be a people of fear, right? But we certainly don't need an army to come against us like we see in this scripture. So um, I have a quote here uh, that, that talks about even, even in, within religion, how, how we try to mitigate our fears 
through control. So this is, I, I've been in, a, in a, a, a bit of a, I find an author I like and then I just start reading all of his stuff. So recently it's been a guy by the name of Sky Jatani, and he writes this in his book, With. Uh, and he says this, he says that fear and control are the basis for all human, and I kind of insert in there, man-made religion. And that's the basis of, of human religion. We live in a very dangerous world, marked by chaos, ugliness, and scarcity. He says, as we come to recognize the dangers around us, we, we feel afraid, and in turn, we try to mitigate our fear by seeking control. And we believe that through control, we can protect ourselves from danger and therefore reduce our fears. And so he goes on to say like how in, in, in trying to control through, through our religious acts of like, if I just do the right things, then, then maybe God will, will bless me. Or, or if, I, I, if I just like live by the right principles, then, you know, it's gonna, everything's going to work out because I'm living God's way. Like while these are true in and of themselves, if we put our hope in the things that we can do, then it's like we're, we're, we're trying to be the, the one that's controlling God instead of the ones that are trusting God. And so let's see, what, what, is, what does Jehoshaphat do when he was afraid? So I'm picking it up in verse 3. It says, Then Jehoshaphat was afraid, and he set his face to seek the Lord. So when, when we fall into a fear-based response of fight or flight, right, uh, we are focusing on the wrong things. And so this would be the, the next obstacle. If, if fear is kind of the entryway into this, the next obstacle within myself that I see is that I am focusing on the wrong things. In fight, uh, in control, I'm focusing on, on the army that's out there or the, the thing that's in front of me that I want to conquer. In flight, I'm focusing on myself and my own self-preservation, but what does Jehoshaphat do? He focuses on the Lord. And so we're going to read through this next section here of what does he do in focusing on the Lord. And again, not that these are all prescriptive, that we've got to follow exactly what he does in every single one of these things, but maybe that there's something in his response that would instruct us. So what does he do? So um, Jehoshaphat was afraid. He set his face to seek the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. Right? So he's serious about this. He's like, okay, guys, we need to, like, let's dedicate ourselves to the Lord. And so, and Judah assembled to seek help from the Lord. From all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. So the biggest thing that I see here is that he doesn't do it alone. He doesn't, he doesn't try and just say, like, okay, I'm going to muscle through and I'm going to do this. Because I feel like what we tend to do or what I tend to do is in isolation, I'll say, like, you know what, I think I can handle this. But isolation just is a breeding ground for anxiety, but Jehoshaphat, no, he says, you know what? Let's call together all the people and do this together. We're not going to do this alone. All right? And the next thing he does is then he, he prays, right? Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court and said, O Lord, God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. In your hand are power and might so that none is able to withstand you. Did you not, O oh God, drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friends? And they have lived in it and have built for you in it a sanctuary for your name, saying, if disaster comes upon us, the sword, judgment, or pestilence, or famine, we will stand before this house and before you, for your name is in this house, and cry out to you in our affliction, and you will hear and save so he is, if I look at those words that he used in there, it almost tells like, like it sounds like, is he, is he reminding God of things? It, has God forgotten them? Oh Lord, God of the fathers, are you not God in heaven? And so I wonder, how much of this was he saying for God's sake, and how much was he saying for his own heart to reposition himself to remind himself of God's goodness and to, and to reposition himself into this larger narrative, right, of the larger story of what, what was God doing in Israel, right? And then his next part, uh, he, he tells him, he says to God, okay, he, this is like, let your request be known to God. It, it, the, he picks up in verse 10, he says this, and now, behold, 
the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, whom you would not let Israel invade when they came from the land of Egypt, and whom they avoided and did not destroy, behold, they reward us by coming to drive us out of your possession, which you have given us to inherit. And here's his request. O oh, our God, will you not execute judgment on them? He makes his request known to God. And then I find this next part just so, um, you know, the humility and the honesty of what he says next. In verse 12, he says, For we are powerless against this great horde that's coming against us. We don't know what to do. But our eyes are on you. That's that focus. Again, what is his focus? You know, he admits in humility, like, he can't do this by himself, that his focus is on the Lord. So, when facing what feels like a threat, right, I start to respond in fear and anxiety, or, or, or some of us start to respond in, 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 in fighting and in control, take a moment to stop, to pray, to set our face to seek the Lord, to seek what, what, to put our request before him, to see what he would say. So, and this is where things get kind of crazy, and, and what happens next. And uh, so, let me read this next section of what happens next after they focus on the Lord. So this is verse 13. It says, meanwhile, all Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, their wives, and their children. It says, And the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, son of Benaiah, son of Jael, son of Mataniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph, in the midst of the assembly. And he said this. He said, Listen, all Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, Do not be afraid, and do not be dismayed at this great horde, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow, go down against them. Behold, they will come up by the ascent of Ziz. You will find them at the end of the valley, east of the wilderness of Jeruel. You will not need to fight in this battle. Stand firm, hold your position, and see the salvation of the Lord on your behalf. O oh, Judah and Jerusalem, do not be afraid and do not be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them and the Lord will be with you. And can we pause there for a minute? That sounds like this is amazing news delivered from a prophet of God. But if I put myself in Jehoshaphat's shoes, the king of this nation, trouble is coming. I don't have the resources to save myself. I've put myself before God. I've, I've asked God to do this. And then I have a word from the Lord that says, okay, God's going to do it. How does my heart respond? Do I actually have the faith to believe what he says. Would I believe it? So, because if my focus has shifted off of the Lord and off of Christ, what can happen is, this is I think the third obstacle in here, is that for me, that we can begin to lose faith. That even when there's a pronouncement, right? So whatever situation that maybe some of you are walking through, and someone comes, and you're, and you're walking through a, a really hard time, whether it's a, a health thing or a, uh, a, a personal thing or an or a interpersonal relational thing or a work thing or a home thing or a thing between uh, you and a spouse. There's all kinds of things. And someone comes up to you, and they speak like Jehaziel, and they say to you, don't be afraid, don't be dismayed, God's going to fight this for you. When I'm in those places, you know the first response that comes through my mind? Yeah, right. It's kind of what I think sometimes. If my eyes are on myself, I 
think, where is my faith? And I wonder if you've been there, because I know I, ha I have. And before, uh, I've shared a little of this story before, before a uh, story, before I worked here, I worked at another church up in Williamsport. And uh, at, at the end of my time there, it all came about because uh, to, to hear the, the leadership there say, hey, we're moving in a new direction, but it doesn't include you. And for me to just be like, what? And in that moment, to think like, okay, I, I feel like I've, have I not done all the right things? Have I not dedicated myself to this work? Have I not, oh, and just for my world to like spin upside down and, and, and like the questions start rolling in, does this mean I'm out of a job? Does this mean I have to, what am I gonna do? How am I gonna care for my family? Oh, my wife's pregnant. I won't have, will I have health insurance? What's, what's gonna happen? Focus on myself. And it was interesting, whenever I was interviewing for the position here after, you know, sometime after I had transitioned out uh, of that ministry and had another job, um, so, you know, God had provided in various ways, and they said, you know, what's one of the biggest things that, that you've learned through this, this whole experience? And uh, I remember saying when I was talking with some of the other pastors in kind of this interview setting, I said, you know what, I feel like I've learned, you know, what my faith really is that maybe somehow previously, like, I felt like I had a really, really strong faith, but when it came down to it, it turns out it was more just like an inflated balloon. And then when circumstances that were out of my control hit, it's like someone just popped the balloon, and then what am I left with but just these, these little pieces? And so I, I wonder if in the midst of, you know, can we be honest enough with each other that in the midst of difficult things, if we lose our focus on the Lord, like how much our faith can suffer, how much we can feel like I have, I have, I have nothing. And I wonder in this moment, you know, it doesn't say what his heart, King Jehoshaphat, you know, it doesn't say how, how he feels about this proclamation. But I wonder, he was a man maybe a stronger leader than me, a better leader than me. But if there was any inkling in his heart of just doubt, of like, oh my goodness, this means we're going to actually go and stand before this army, and there's going to be a moment where either I, this is going to happen or this is not going to happen. I'm going to have to put myself on the line. He's like, is there a moment in there where he's like, I don't know what's going to happen? What do we do in those moments? when our heart doesn't have the faith to say, okay, God, I'm with you. I think it's shown in his, whether or not his heart was there or not, it's shown in his posture of what he does next. And it says this, in verse 18, it says, then Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground. And all Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, they fell down before the Lord. If you can imagine the king in that moment of good proclamation from the prophet, what does he do? The only thing he can do in that moment is to just come before God. And what does he do? He surrenders himself. Whether or not he believes or not, I don't know, in that very moment. But have you ever been there? Where you don't know what to do, and all you can do is just put yourself on, face down on the floor. So, because honestly, when it comes to faith, we cannot move our hearts on our own to believe. You know, I think of the song that says, you just gotta have faith, faith. Is that from the 80s or 90s? Just gotta have faith. But like, when I think about it, like, how do I, is faith something that I muster in myself and just say, okay, I am just gonna, I'm just gonna push on through. Because as soon as we start thinking about faith in that way, then, it, then it's like, well, then is faith just another work that I can do? Is it, but, but Paul says, it's by, by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. This is a gift from God. 
And so I think in these moments, there's something in, in our physical bodies, like I can't control my heart, but what can I control? I can control my body. And I can say, you know what? I am gonna put myself in this posture of surrender and submission to the Lord and just pray he does a work in my heart. And what is it? It's a humble submission and worship. It says they came before him and worshiped the Lord. So in, his, in, in the book uh, I mentioned earlier with uh, by Sky Jatani, <clears throat> He also uh, recounts a story that, that by uh, Henry Nouwen. I haven't read enough Nouwen to find the actual source of where this is in his literature, but he quotes Henry Nouwen. Uh, it's talking about a story where, where uh, he was traveling and he got a, the opportunity to see uh, trapeze artists who were flying through the air at a circus. He was watching the circus, and as Henry, Henry Nouwen was watching them fly through the air, it, it struck him that, like, this is faith. This, is, this describes my Christian life, that it's, it's not about, you know, the guy who's doing the flips and flying through the air. It's all about the catcher. It's all about the person on the other end. And he says, the flyer, this is Sky Jatani's words, he says, the flyer is not the star of the trapeze performance. The maneuvers are only possible because he trusts that he will be caught. Everything depends on the catcher. And this led Nouwen to a new understanding of his Christian life. And we'll have this part of the quote of what Henry Nouwen said. He says, I can only fly freely when I know there is a catcher to catch me. If we were to take risks and to be free in the air and in life, we have to know there's a catcher. We have to know that when we come down from it all, we are going to be caught. We are going to be safe. The hero is the least visible. Trust the catcher. And Sky, he goes on to say that, that, that faith is the opposite of seeking control. It is surrendering control. And in that, it enhances the truth that control is an illusion. We never had it, and we never will. We overcome fear by surrendering control. The surrender is only possible if we have total assurance that we are safe. We must be convinced that if we let go, we will be caught. This assurance only comes when we trust that our Heavenly Father desires to be with us and will not let us fall. And so what do we see in this, in this community that's gathered there? So Jehoshaphat and all the community, they, they, they surrender. That's exactly what they do. They put themselves down on the floor before God. They surrender in that moment to Him. And then there's people in the congregation, like, and then maybe this is some of you. Maybe you're like, you know what? I, I don't know. I, I feel like my faith is strong. Like, we need you. Like, this is what happens in verse 19. There's the, the Levites. They're the ones that have been in charge of worship in the temple all along uh, since the time of Moses. And it was set up. The Levites were there. And what did they do? They, they stayed in the temple. They worshiped there. In verse 19, it says, and the, so imagine this. Jehoshaphat's on the floor. Everybody's face down. And then there are the, the, the Levites. What do they do? The Levites, the Ko Kohathites, and the Korahites, they stood up to praise the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud voice. It's like these two contrasting responses to the word of God. Like for you, those of you who are like, yeah, you know, I hear a word from God and I am just like praising God. We need you to be the encouragement for those of us in those times when we just don't know we can believe both different acts of surrender, different acts of worship. And so what happens next? They rose early in the morning and they went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. And when they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and he said, it's something I think, you know, if there was any doubt before, the night before, if he's looking around at his men and they still see some fear in their eyes as they go out before uh, this army that's approaching. He says, hear me, Judah, and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you will be established. Basically, he's saying, God's got you. He's not going to let you fall. He's the catcher. He will catch you. Believe his prophets, and you will succeed. And then what does he do? So then he takes, he, when he had taken counsel with the people, what is it? So he pull, pulls together his advisors. He says, okay, guys, 
We're here. We had the, the, the word from the prophet. We're, we're going down. We see them. Okay, they're coming up through the ascent of Z's that they said they are. Well, counsel me. What are we going to do in this moment? And what do they do? He appointed those who were to sing to the Lord and praise him in holy attire as they went before the army and say, give thanks to the Lord for his steadfast love endures forever. So what he does is like, okay, what do they all decide? They said, okay, if we surrender to God, we're going to stay in that position of surrender. And what looks like surrender to an oncoming army, they sent the worship team out first. I can imagine the other army like looking at like, where are their spears? They've got instruments. Yeah. And the rest of the people saying like, okay, we're going into battle with these people and okay. It looks like surrender to the enemy, but it's surrender to God. And what does God do? It says, and when they began to sing and praise the Lord, the Lord set an ambush against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir who had come against Judah so that they were routed. And like, I don't know why God does that. Why is it? God could have totally done this and defeated the armies back when they were like on the plains of En Gedi, like when they were approaching. He could have done it, but he didn't. He said, look, they're coming and I'm calling you out to take a step of faith. Do you trust me? Because I think ultimately, God's not concerned about like the army coming. He's not concerned about all of this. He's concerned about their hearts. And he says, what looks like defeat and disaster to your eyes, look, no, this is my deliverance for you if you just trust me and step out in faith. So, the battle belongs to the Lord. I'm going to finish up this part. It says, For the men of Ammon and Moab rose against the inhabitants. This is verse 23. So the Moab and Ammon, they rose up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir, devoting them to destruction. And when they had made an end to the inhabitants of Seir, they all helped to destroy one another. And then when Judah came to the watchtower of the wilderness, they looked toward the horde, and behold, there were dead bodies lying on the ground that none had escaped. The battle belongs to the Lord. And so to wrap things up today, like, is this not a picture of the gospel of Jesus Christ? It says, like, in our brokenness and in our separation from God, that, that we can't do anything to fix ourselves. And we say, like, well, uh, it's just too big. It's like that army that's coming or the, the situation that's in front of us. If it's something external, it says, look, God, this is too big for me. And God says, no, I am going to rescue you. You need only be silent. You need only come before me. You need only surrender to me. You only need to just trust a little that he fights the fights that we cannot win. He defeats sin in our place. And so our salvation doesn't come because we fight for it. It comes because we surrender to God. That's the essence of faith. We surrender. He draws near. We worship he fights our battles. And so in the end, what happens in the war zone, what, what, what had been this, this battlefield, this war zone there, it becomes a place of blessing. They actually renamed the, the, the I'm not going to read the whole rest of this chapter, but they, they renamed the valley and calls the Valley of Berakah, which is literally the Valley of Blessing. They go out and they, they take the spoils of war and they, and they get all sorts of things that God has just blessed them with provision and how God wants to do that and take these areas of our lives that feel in this moment like dead. And he, even to come back to me of like this idea of like the, the, the situation at the, at the other church and then like, can God take that and then redeem this? And like what we have found is just God's blessing poured out in so many ways as we transition here. 
things that, that were maybe in my, my view of the world that looked like, oh no, things are falling apart, but God said, no, wait, I have something better for you. I have more. It becomes a valley of blessing. So, some of us may be in this position of Jehoshaphat, like that there's a threat that feels like it's approaching. What do we do? We fall in our face and surrender. Some of us may, may be in the position of the Levites and like, you know, we hear the word of the Lord and the declaration of him and we just like, we need to rejoice and lift our voice in song. But even if your faith does not feel strong, if it feels deflated, you know, there, God, God is not angered by that. He's tender towards you. And he's calling you out to take one step towards him. Maybe you're not ready to jump on the trapeze and say, okay, God, catch me. But, you know, maybe you don't even trust your feet to stand sometimes. But what I see in here is this surrender to him, to the one who catches us. Because his heart is for you to fly. And he will catch you. You pray with me. God, I don't know the situations of, of individual lives, but I know because the world is broken that we all face broken things. Broken hearts. Broken relationships. Things that we cannot fix on our own. God, would you move in our hearts to, to, to just even plant the seed of, of faith that's an idea that there may be something different than fighting. There may be di something different than fighting, than, 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 than something different from flying away and fleeing and running. Maybe there's a response of faith. Even if we are fearful, we go from, not from fearful to fighting, but fearful to faithful in you what that even looks like to take a step to trust you. God, would you reveal that to our hearts in the place that, that we can't change, God, that you would reach in there and that you would speak. And we lift this up before you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Church, let's come together for one last song of worship today as we sing our grateful devotion to our Lord. Stand as you join us in hymn number 68. We praise thee, O God, our Redeemer. And we started with praise this morning. We're going to end with praise. We praise thee, O God, our Redeemer. Thank you, Pastor Aiden, for bringing those words to us today. And whether you're, uh, you're in the worship team that's there in front and you're just praising God, or maybe you're Jehoshaphat, humbly kneeling before God, 
wherever you're at, um, know that we are here with you and we want to support you with that. If you've come here today and you've got something that you'd like to, to have someone pray with you uh, for, please come forward. Either side of the stage, we'll have members of our prayer team who are here. Um, happy to pray with you. If you're, you're worshiping with us online, you can click the request prayer button. We have, we have members of our prayer team who will pray with you online. And if you prefer, uh, we also have prayer cards in the chairs in front of you. You can fill one of those out and leave that in the drop boxes on, on your way out. Um, don't go with that need unmet today. Um, as you're going into the week ahead, um, I was really inspired by, by one of the songs that we sang this morning. Uh, sometimes we sing this because we are on the mountaintop, and other times we say this because uh, we're broken, and we say it out of faith, trusting that God will be faithful and true. This is from Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Go in that promise and that blessing of the Lord. Bless his holy name.